Dark Matter, we've known him for a long time, and he does crazy stuff. <laughs> and he's kind of notorious in the industry. So, ladies and gentlemen, I present to you Dark Matter! Holy cow. That was crazy. Can everyone hear me good? Love you, Mike. Love you, too. Okay, I guess you can hear me good. Okay. Sorry, that <laughs> got me a little emotional. Um, welcome to some wireless monitoring, Wi-Fi monitoring, Wi-Fi monitoring over 9,000. I hope you guys are all in the right place. All right, a little bit about me. How many of you uh, are here at St. Con for the first time? Just curious. You guys were me four years ago, and it was amazing, and it's just kind of built from there, and like this community has really just enabled me. And now I'm up here talking about this thing, and it's hashtag Wi-Fi Cactus, and I can't even believe that that's happened. And uh, I'm just really honored, and, and thank you guys so much for being interested in my projects and the things that I do. Um, so... A little bit about me, uh, I graduated uh, with a degree in computer science from Southern Utah University, go T-Birds, yeah. And uh, right now, um, I just recently uh, left my job and I'm gonna start doing a lot more freelance. Um, so if anybody needs somebody that does weird wireless stuff or a uh, little bit of security, come hit me up. Uh, I'd be glad to talk to you about that. So uh, trying to get more involved in this. Previously, my, my background was um, in physics I uh, worked for a semiconductor manufacturing company. <sighs> this project is really a project that is like on the shoulders of giants. And there's so many people that I have to say a huge, huge thank you to because it wouldn't be possible without, um, without all these people. Uh, first off, this year specifically, huge shout out to Hack5 because this is a sponsored project from them. Uh, Darren Kitchen, uh, Seb, Shannon, Morris, all of the, the Hack5 folks just have been super cool and hooked this thing up and just enabled uh, the next level of this, as well as helping me get some additional press and interviews and things like that. Uh, at Black Hat, oh, it, it, they've always been really good to me, the, the Black Hat family, especially the people in the NOC. That's Grifter, Stumper, Lean, um, uh, Nemus, Caesar, a bunch of people. Anyways, it's just awesome. They let me go into the knock and put my toys in the knock, which is crazy because there's people like RSA in there and Pony Express and Ruckus and these huge names and then me. <laughs> so it's crazy. Uh, DEF CON, huge shout out to Dark Tangent for like allowing me to do crazy things at his conference and having that. Uh, Comp. Jeremy, the sock guys, the goons there, they enabled me to like set this thing up and walk around and they were like super helpful with crowds because it, it was insane. Um, Render Man, he was one of the ones who established the Church of Wi-Fi. Uh, so he's been doing this for 13, 15 years, this types of stuff. Uh, just in so many more. And if I forget, forget you guys, uh, thank you. And especially you guys for being interested in it. Like I would not be here and doing these types of projects if it wasn't for your interest level. And so I thank you guys for having an interest in wireless and wireless security. So why do we want to mo monitor wireless? Well, here's some pretty good reasons on the board here. It's everywhere, everyone's using it. It's on all the time. People hardly remember to turn it off. It's a, it's a, it takes the effort to turn off wireless when you're not using it. Uh, there isn't any like major geofencing features they're starting to make those, but a few years ago, those weren't even uh, in people's thoughts. The other thing, too, is why do we want to do this is to better understand the risks. And there's stuff that, can be, that we can find that's actually worth finding, which we'll get into more here later. Also, curiosity. I'm a hacker at heart, and so I'm very a curious person, and I like to take things apart. I like to build things. I like to put things together um, and understand how they work at a fundamental level. All right, so uh, I'm going to go through and kind of give you just a, qu uh, a quick history and breakdown of um, uh, how this project all came together. So the history of this project was at DEF CON 23. I had this crazy idea about two weeks before the conference. I wonder what it would be like if I took a little box, put a wireless radio in it, and just put it in my backpack and walked around the whole time at the con and saw what I got. Because, of course, I I've used Kismet and I've used other wireless air crack and other wireless stuff. 
and uh, it's always interesting to see what you get. But then it's like, okay, well, DEF CON has, uh, at that time, it was probably like 15 to 18,000 attendees. It would be interesting to see what people are doing there because it's the largest hacker convention in the world. So I created a BeagleBone Black, had two alphas, and it had about 12 hours of battery life. And it was insane what I caught. It was really interesting. Not only that, St. Con let me come here and talk about it, which is crazy. So that's online somewhere if you're interested and want to check that out. I went through kind of the statistics, the things I found. Um, and then also, at the time, I didn't know about some of the other frameworks or didn't understand how the wireless worked very much. Uh, and so I used the Aircrack framework, which was not the right tool for the job. But it also inspired me to do things bigger. So then, the next year, DEF CON 24, last year, Project Lana was born. So I started talking about my project to St. Con and other people, and it turned out that people from Intel wanted to get involved and help, be helpful with this. So they're like, hey, have 12 minnow boards. That's an open source project that is created by a bunch of uh, people who work for Intel. They gave me a bunch of products, and they also sponsored the project. I deployed 12 nodes throughout uh, DEF CON. As far as I know, I'm the only legitimate monitoring uh, uh, devices that were set up at the conference. So I deployed these 12 boxes, got a bunch of data, learned about Kismet, learned how to get PCAPs. Also, it was the first year or the first time that I know of, 802.11ac had been monitored. Uh, open source anyways. You could get commercial tools, but it was like 1500 or, or more to be able to monitor 802.11ac. Well, I was able to find some drivers. I was able to get those drivers to work with Kismet, and so I was monitoring 802.11ac last year. So again, presented that project here, and I presented some the findings some other places. And uh, yeah, again, that's a talks online somewhere. You can probably check that out. So one thing about that project, though, is that I deployed boxes, I put them into places, but nobody really knew they were there, except for when we were walking through conference, the conference center with our, uh, uh, holding our boxes, and I got some goons with me, and we're hiding them under tables and hiding them under the stage, hiding them in probably in places we probably shouldn't have. Uh, and so, but it was kind of, uh, it was kind of a, a, a quiet um, way to deploy. People didn't really know that this project was going on, other than when I presented the data last year. So then, last year, or uh, that really inspired me. I wanted to do more. So, <laughs> it kind of, it kind of got a little bit out of hand. <laughs> Basically, what happened is. I was in New York, and I was working um, at a national laboratory doing some research, and I'm sitting there just paying away on the keyboard, I'm waiting for some results to come up, and I look on Twitter, and I see a tweet from Grifter that's like, oh, ShmooCon, amazing, yay, party. And I was like, oh, hey, I wanna go to ShmooCon. So I look on a map, and I realize I'm within four hours driving distance of Washington, D.C. from Long Island. So I'm like, huh, should I stay or should I go? So Grifter tweets at me and is like, no, you get over here now. And I was like, okay, that's crazy. Jump in the car right then and start driving down to Washington, D.C. to go to ShmooCon. So then, as soon as I get to ShmooCon, um, I, I started meeting up with people and uh, I ran into Darren Kitchen. I've known him for a little while, um, but I didn't know him that well. And I was telling him about my wireless monitoring project last year and I told him about SaintCon. We also did an interview on Hack5 about it. Um, which he kind of remembered. But then he's like, well, what, what was the big thing that you took away from last year? And I'm like, well, the biggest problem that I had was fragmented packets. Yeah, I had 12 boxes deployed around the conference center, but all the frames are fragmented. So I would get SSIDs that were only partial. I would get uh, you know, only parts of the communication. Uh, somebody would start a DDoS attack or, or a deauthentication attack, and I would only see a few pieces of the, the puzzle. So I'm like, I want more. And he's like, well, what do you think you'd need to make that? And I'm like, I don't know, maybe like 20 radios? And he's like, all right, I'll take care of you. And I was like, are you serious? He's like, yeah. Two, literally two weeks later, 40 Hack5 Tetras show up in my house in a box. And I'm like, oh, crap. Now I actually have to do this. And again, again, this is a sponsor project. Just want to let you know. So, but you can do this with any sort of open source radio. Uh, ATH9Ks, that's basically what's in a Tetra. It has two of those, so we'll get on, to, get on to the next piece. If the clicker will click. There we go. 
again, sponsored. So this is the 40 radios that showed up to my house. And this is what it looks like when they're stacked up on your desk. And that's one of the boxes of the three. <laughs> so yeah, anyways, so go support Hack Shop. OK, so then what happens? When you have that many Tetras, or that many radios, or that many pieces of equipment, you got to get something working. So I'm like, hey, I'll build this little cute thing. It's got six of them in here. I can strap it together with some uh, 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 zip ties, basically. <laughs> it's all held together with Velcro. And uh, yeah, you can even turn it sideways. And I'm like, if I can make it work on six, I can scale this to X, right? Like, if it can work with six, it can go to X. So um, I built this thing up. I took it to work. All my coworkers were freaking out. Uh, and, but it was a proof of concept, and it worked. And it has a 25 amp hour battery, which means that this little guy could be dead dropped for like 20 hours. So I was like, all right, this is, this is the, way, the way I'm gonna go. This is the way I'm gonna do this. Um, because this is, I'm just gonna replace my briefcases I had the year before with these. But then I was like, no, I wanna do the, I wanna capture, I wanna capture all the things. I wanna capture everything. So, uh, I ended up, uh, oh, yeah, I ended up deciding that we're just gonna build this thing out to the max. We're gonna include as many Tetras as I can. We're gonna build it out. So real quick, I'm gonna talk about the hardware. The hardware on this guy is, like I said, 25 Tetras. Uh, and then it, um, I've got two six Cisco 16 port switches. There's an Intel Nook at the top, that's 16 gigs of RAM, 512 or NVMe drive, so super fast. Uh, Intel Nook, let's see, I've got a 500 watt, 12 volt power supply down there. Oh yeah, I gotta talk about the Arduino Micro in here that's running the lights, because of course lights. And a lead acid car battery, because you know, you gotta use what's available when you decide to put make it mobile five days before the conference. So this is kind of the build process. So in the first picture, you can see it's just the frame, um, the frame without uh, all the other components on it. So basically we're just like, okay, well, you could stack Tetras all together, in all going the one way, but then it doesn't look as cool, right? Because the antennas aren't offset, plus they'll interfere with each other. So I wanted them to be rotated 90 degrees. So the problem is, is as you can see from the Cacti Mini, the Tetras don't really line up with each other when you go 90 degrees. Plus, they were never meant to sit that way. So then you had to build custom machined aluminum, or uh, uh, um, custom machined plastic for rails to support the, the change of that. So my friend Austin, who's a, um, just a ninja at things machining and fabrication, came up with this idea of smashing them together, but then also having rails that support it. So then, oops. So then in the middle picture there, I started stacking the components, putting it all together. And then I'm like, oh dear, I need to figure out how to put the switches on. <laughs> so I just put them on top, drilled some stuff through, tapped them and attached them to the top. I'm like, all right, so that's good. So then in the third picture, I'm like, oh crap, now I gotta put wires. So like, things get kind of out of hand when you're doing a project of this scale. There's a lot of pieces to it, a lot of components to it, and it, wire management becomes pretty rough. So as you can tell from that picture, we just kind of had wires going everywhere. It's, it was insane. But finally, we were able to get LEDs on it, and we were able to get it all completed. So uh, one other thing that happened in this process too, I think I got these slides out of, out of order. Hold on, uh, we'll get to, uh, we'll, we'll probably find, we'll come across the slide, I just got something out of order. The other thing on this is the frame. So the backpack frame, went into a hardware store, uh, or a, a hunting store, and I found this open frame and I was like, you know what that'll be perfect for? Putting this thing on my back. So, because uh, that was ultimately my, my idea was to have this war walk, to be able to war walk with this thing. So the frame enabled that. Thanks to my friend Brian, he helped me with some, with some late nights, get the fabrication of the frame, being able to attach it, to be able to pull it off so that it could be worn. All right, so real quick. Oh, <laughs> I started talking about the frame. Yeah, I did have these out of orders. But real quick, there was a situation that I learned about how pineapple firmwares work uh, as soon as you turn them on. So that by default, in that picture you see a bunch of beacons. This is basically from an app uh, called uh, Kismet, or excuse me, Wiggle. This is an app for, called Kiz, uh, Wiggle on your phone, uh, and this is just at my house. So basically, I get these all stacked together, and I'm plugging in power, and then I turn it on, and I'm like, yeah, we're making progress, I'm about ready to program these. All of a sudden, my kids are like, 
hey, Dad, there isn't any Wi-Fi. The Internet's working. YouTube's not working on my tablet. And I'm like, uh, I don't understand. So I pull out my phone, and I look at this, and I see 25-plus uh, radios beaconing on my network. And so, like, just having this, each one of these beacon out will just DOS the environment. Completely destroyed it. So I had to go in and manually turn off 25 radios uh, so that way my kids could start watching YouTube again. So lessons learned there. If you're going to do something at scale of this large, you got to make sure that you beacon responsibly. <laughs> so this is uh, me and Brian late at night, probably waking up my neighbors, drilling stuff together and banging and attaching parts. So uh, the, it's custom aluminum frames. We've got some custom aluminum machining, so I couldn't have done it without my friend Austin, Brian, uh, and just a ton of people helped me out on this. All right, one other part of this that's pretty important is the pineapple at the top. So uh, funny story, I was in the Black Hat Knock. I'm sitting there, and this guy's like, you know what that's missing? A pineapple on top. He literally gets on his phone on Amazon, overnights a pineapple to an Amazon locker on the strip, which is a thing, apparently. You can overnight things, sometimes same day them, apparently. Gets it there. He comes over to my hotel room. We stick it on, and it's, like, done. So Richard and Canada, dude, huge shout-out to you. Thank you, man, for putting the iconic pineapple on the top. And that just shows it takes a community to do these type of projects. And it's awesome how many people are like, oh, you know what would be cool? Let's add this and let's do this. And it happens and it gets done and it's amazing. And I appreciate uh, having that collaboration. It really makes the project better. Okay, the software side of things. So in years past, uh, the first year I did the wireless monitoring project, I was using AirCrack, which is the wrong tool because it's mainly built around cracking passwords only. So its idea is to only capture the parts of the wireless frame that will get that, uh, the, get that pieces for you uh, to do the cracking. Now there's a sweet tool called Kismet. Well, I mean, that's been around since 2013, it's 2003, sorry. So it's been around for a really long time. But there's a new version of Kismet uh, that's way, way better. It's not even officially released yet. So I got to know the developer of Kismet, Dragorn, and he started building this custom version and making modifications for me. So the new version of Kismet, the, 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 the release is going to be happening very soon. It's very stable at this point. Um, you can still go run the, the, the beta version on GitHub. Basically, uh, we're running like super beta, beta software on this, and it's all web-based. So the way that this works is each one of these devices acts as a remote capture node. So it's just a dummy device. It's as if it were like a USB stick plugged into the Nook. So then it's piping all of its data over Ethernet to the Nook, and I've got a single session of Kismet. Depending on our time, and I think I'm being allotted a little extra, I'll be able to do a live demo and show you all the devices uh, so we can go through that and see how that works. But basically, it's as if each one of these Tetras is plugged in at, like a USB port into the Nook. So this solves the problem of data aggregation, because my original plan was to run Kismet on every single node, which is what I did the previous year, but it took me three months to do data analysis on 12 boxes. This is 25 boxes, the scale would just be out of control. So luckily, I'm aggregating all the data and analysis back to the Nook, uh, thanks to Kismet and thanks to this new version. So what does this mean for you? If you want to run Kismet and have wireless IDS scattered throughout your network, put some nodes up, connect them with Ethernet, and you can pipe it back to a single session of Kismet in your NOC or your SOC, and you can now have wireless IDS in your system. So go check out Kismet. It's doing amazing things. Uh, support them on Patreon. Um, it, it's, it's a fantastic project that's providing like next level wireless information. Um, yeah, so the moral of the story is everything's going to a single PCAP file, which makes it very nice for analysis. Okay, so I want to talk about some FAQs because um, I've gotten a lot of questions and I've, and I've been super happy to answer all of these questions and I love the questions, so hopefully we can have some Q&A. If not, I'll be around. You guys can come find me and I'll, you can ask me more questions. But I want to cover some of the basic ones really quick for you guys. How much does it weigh? So the frame itself, without the battery, is about 45 pounds, and then there's about a 10-pound battery, and then I think we've got another 15-pound battery, so roughly between 55 and 60 pounds total. How much, uh, how much data do you get? So uh, at Black Hat, in about seven hours, I caught 40 gigs. Yesterday here, just walking around for an hour and a half, I caught 13 gigs. 
So I don't know what you guys are doing on the wireless, but bravo, <laughs> bravo. So it, it gets a lot of data. Uh, am I getting cancer? Probably YOLO. Um, actually, it's non-ionizing non radiation, so probably not. Um, and it's pretty low, uh, low power output. But when you times that by 25, hopefully the ideal output is zero because this is only a receiving device. It is, it is meant to be completely passive to only receive. Uh, are you planning on having kids? I already have two kids, so I'm good. Um, is it hot? Yes, it gets pretty hot. So this thing draws about 500 watts of power. And when you draw about 500 watts of power, to put that in perspective, that's about a half a toaster running all the time. Uh, it starts getting warm towards the top. The hottest I've seen it at the top after about 30 hours of running is about 38 degrees Celsius. So, or excuse me, 70 degrees Celsius, sorry. Uh, so pretty toasty, pretty, pretty toasty. So I was asking Darren, I'm like, hey, what's the like, max temperature specification? He's like, oh, I probably wouldn't go more than 75, 80 degrees Celsius. And I'm like, okay, all right. So normally I'd be like, all right, slap fans on here, figure out cooling. I actually started doing that work. And then I remembered it's a sponsored project. So again, YOLO, right? Okay, how much did it cost? It's a sponsored project, so luckily the bulk of it, I did not come out of my pocket. But the retail price of a Tetra is $200 a pop times 25. Then you take into account a Nook, those things are a little bit pricey, like 500. Uh, the power supplies, the custom frames, the, not including all that labor, I'm figuring about six to $7,000 of retail is what this would cost to build. Um, and then, uh, uh, yeah, I don't even want to think about how many hours I, I put into this thing. Uh, it's a labor of love. And then people ask me, what did TSA think about it? Luckily, haven't done the TSA thing yet, so I don't know. I've been driving everywhere I've gone. I drove to Phoenix, to Cactus Con, I drove here, I drove to Vegas. Uh, so Utah's pretty centrally located for some cool places, so th that's kind of nice. However, next month, I got invited to go speak at a conference called Def Camp in Romania. So I'm gonna take it. So we'll see how that goes. And I, I, I think that that's kind of like one of those uh, bars pretty high for going to Romania to see, if, to see how far we can make it with this. So cross our fingers, gonna get insurance, see what can happen. Uh, last question, I think, on my FAQ. How long does the battery last? Um, when we first set it up, it was about two hours on this battery. One of our other batteries, we got like three hours. But yesterday, I only got an hour and a half. So I think my batteries are getting kind of, their lives are kind of uh, dropping a bit. Okay. So back to uh, the story of being at Black Hat and DEF CON. So at Black Hat and DEF CON, uh, I decided to go war walking. I, I tried to get a room at Mandalay Bay, which would have been super nice because I don't know if you guys have ever stayed at the Luxor. Uh, it's quite a ways away from the Mandalay Convention Center, and there's quite a walk. For some reason, the hotel decided to put me in the far side from the convention center. So I was literally on the opposite side, as you can see from the yellow line, maybe. Yeah, you can see that. On the opposite side on the yellow line, all the way to the convention center, clear on the other side. So, um, yeah. Of course, you know, I gotta keep track of my power steps. It's about 400 or 4,000 feet, 1,800 steps, power steps, especially when you got something weighing this much on your back. So I decided that I'm gonna go walk through the casino, walk from there through the, <laughs> through the little form shop area, through Mandalay Casino, into the convention center with this thing on my back. Right before I was leaving, I looked in the mirror and I'm like, I don't know if I should do this. Like, well, we'll see what happens. I made it, as you could tell from these pictures here. So I come walking into the knock. The funny thing, the funny thing, they didn't know I was coming. I, I, I'm pretty sure they didn't know I was coming. So I start walking up. I don't have a black hat badge either. Security, the, 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 the black hat staff see me with this. They're like, whoa, what is that? As I'm going up the escalator right past them. I get to the black hat knock. The, the convention center security guard is like, let me get that door for you. That looks heavy.
I walk in and the picture, oh, it's coming. I walk in and the picture on the right here is everyone wondering, what is this guy doing here? How did he get in here? What is going on? And the funny thing about this, I got to laser point this, this guy, he's like, what is this? This guy, what is this? This guy, this guy, this guy, all these eyes are on me. Except for this guy, he's like, unimpressed. <laughs> Should have tried harder, bro. Oh, by the way, that photo credit goes to Lean. Good old Kev dog. All right. The thing about the Luxor, though, though when, you're, when you're doing a project like this, you have stuff. And you have a lot of stuff. So that's the cart I brought to the Luxor. Um, and what's crazy is in recent events with the shooting and stuff, people are like, how did this guy get so much stuff in his room? It's not hard. It's not hard. So, but one thing that is surprising to me, which uh, I'll talk about in this story, so while I was gone over at the Black Hat Knock, I forgot to put the privacy sign up on my room. So there's this, this group of people in hotels called GSAs. Anyone know what GSA means? What? I do, yeah. Guest services, uh, I forgot what the A is actually. Guest services something. Agency, yeah, guest services agency. Anyways, the, the guest services, they're the maid service. It's their technical term for maid service. They're the eyes and ears of the hotel. So they went into my room, started to clean up, but it looked like this, the picture on the right there. Yeah, you're right. And uh, <laughs> they kind of flagged it. So I'm over at Black Hat all day, you know, just minding my own business, just setting up my cactus, putting it in the knock. And I'm like, oh, I need to go back to my room. So I get back there, put the card in, and it blinks, three orange lights. Who knows what that means? It doesn't mean that your card doesn't work anymore because I went down to the front desk to ask them that. And they're like, there's no problem with your car. You just need to hang out here for a minute. <laughs> so I'm standing there and I'm like, oh crap. I'm like, they didn't stop me when I was walking through. Nobody came over to the Black Hat Knock to get me about the cactus. I wonder what could this could be about. Guy shows up. He turns out to be the chief uh, security, uh, in chief investigator for the Luxor. And he's like, yeah, I need you to come with me. You need to explain to me what you've got in your room. And I was like, oh, crap. But then, like, part of me is, like, relieved because this isn't in there. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm like, this can't be too bad. So on the walk over, we're sitting there, we're talking, and he's like, okay, I know you're not too big of a threat because I saw the Xbox controller. And I was like, yes, always bring an Xbox controller with you. <laughs> so he's like, what are you doing? And I'm like, well, I'm really passionate about wireless, and we're here for a conference. He's like, yeah, are you one of those hackers? And I'm like, kind of. <laughs> and uh, he's, like, he's like, okay, well, tell me, about, uh, uh, tell me about what you got going on in the room. I'm like, well, I do wireless monitoring. I like to see what's going on in the environment. I do stuff to detect threats, also to see what sort of vulnerabilities exist in there. And he's like, oh, that's really cool. And it was a really awesome opportunity because I got to teach him about, you know, hey, are you in, is your phone in airplane mode? What does that mean? Is your wireless on? Is your wireless actually broadcasting when you turn it off? And so it was a really a cool opportunity to have some discussion with him. So he grabs another security officer with him, and they're escorting me back to the room. And so I get to teach him, too, some of these things. So I'm bringing him back, and the, cac the mini cacti was in there. And I'm, like, going through what this thing is and how it works. And they're just like, man, this is crazy. I've never seen anything like this. And I'm like, okay, well, here's the thing. I got to be honest with you. <laughs> this isn't the only thing. <laughs> Over at the Mandalay Bay in the convention center, I've got this big one that's like 25 of these, and I'm probably going to be walking through again. And he's like, all right, so what do you need from us? I'm like, just tell your guys in the security booth not to tackle me when they see me. <laughs> so he's like, all right, all right, and that's fine. That's fair. And uh, so we fist bump, do all the things, and uh, they let me go and l unlock my room. So uh, real quickly, the, uh, the reason why they were really interested in my room is because of the antennas. So apparently a lot of people stay at the Luxor, and they'll typically stay on the side that goes towards McCarran Airport. They'll bring in large antennas and lots of different things and try to either pick up information from the airport, or there's even been cases of them jamming information he was telling me about 
at the airport, which is a federal crime. And so they have a zero tolerance policy for people bringing antennas and stuff into the thing. Luckily, I kind of got a pass. All right, so back to Black Hat. Oh, yeah, the moral of that story is, you know, use your privacy sign if you got stuff in your room. You know, you don't need, you don't really need your bed made every day. Uh, the wi uh, back to the Wi-Fi cactus uh, at Black Hat. So I had this clever idea. What if I went down to the vendor area with it? <laughs> like, <laughs> that was insane. So uh, we got a group of people. We started heading down there. And at one point, I ended up getting put in this little thing here, this little triangle and roped off. And <laughs> they're like, and then people just came up and asked me questions. I, I don't know. You have to ask someone else that was there. But I think I was getting more uh, people to my little thing here than a lot of those booths. <laughs> and I don't know if you can see it. You can't really see it. There's a guy in a suit in the background right there. He was not happy I was doing this. He's trying to give out $100 bills to people to come pay to play this little game. And I'm standing here just like, hey, Wi-Fi, come talk to me. Are you in airplane mode? I'm just reminding you to do that. And so, yeah, he was, he was not happy. So, yeah, that was pretty funny. So then we end up at DEF CON. And, like, there was a lot of people that were, like, really enthused about this at Black Hat. But DEF CON was next level. Um, I, everywhere, like as soon as I walked into the convention center, I didn't even expect the type of reception that I got. I walked in and just crowds of people were like, what is this thing and how do I hack it? <laughs> <laughs> Which was really cool and it's really awesome to see that type of reception. So then at DEF CON, I actually did a demo lab, uh, completely live demo, completely unscripted, me just showing this thing off. And again, just the, the reception, the number of people that came to it was just amazing. And what was awesome about it, too, is that within the three hours that I was giving my demo on the first day, probably within the first 45 minutes of that three hours, I saw over 20,000 clients, and it overwhelmed the hardware I have on this and crashed Kismet, for which patches have been made so that that way it won't crash again. <laughs> <laughs> Open source for the win. So, which was crazy, 20,000, like think about that, 20,000 client devices within the vicinity of my range. Who knows what the range of Wi-Fi is? Shout it out. Over 9,000, I wish. Yeah, I, I heard somebody say about 100 meters. Pretty short, right? That's crazy. There was 20,000 devices. I mean, they, they had an estimated, I think, like 22,000 people there. So, and how many devices do you have on you right now that have MAC addresses? I've got at least four. <laughs> but maybe I'm not normal. <laughs> so then last week I decided, or was it two weeks ago, I decided to take the cactus to Cactus Con. Seemed appropriate. Quick plug for Cactus Con, they didn't even know I was coming. They let me set up a booth and do demo labs in the, uh, in the vendor area, <laughs> which was really cool. So I got to talk to a bunch of people about that. Uh, about this with them at that conference. So Phoenix isn't too far away. It might be a cool con to check out. Quick little plug for them. All right, the datas, the meat, the data. So this is what it looks like when you're trying to do data analysis on what you're capturing with this. How many of you deal with like PCAPs in mass? Like how many of you guys do? Like, yeah, it's, it's crazy. And it feels like this, right? <sighs> super overwhelming, it's going super fast, and you don't even, you can't even catch it. All right, anyway, I thought that was pretty cool. All right, so the key here is we're preparing, with this, this main goal is to prepare for the Wi-Fi drought, because it's going to happen. It's going to happen. So just a couple of key numbers here. This year, I caught over 138 gigs of data just at Black Hat and DEF CON. Like I said, I already caught 12 gigs yesterday here. I caught like 20 gigs at Cactus Con. So this is just a lot, a lot of data. Compared to the previous years, uh, the previous year I caught 42 gigs, but keep in mind that was with the 12 boxes. The year before that it was 280 megs with my one little big old bone black box. So kind of a little bit different. Total unique MAC addresses, 104,000 only this year. Come on, man, couldn't you get more? Well, the thing is, 
I only ran this at DEF CON for probably a total, and Black Hat, I would say like 10 hours total. Last year with the Box project, I ran that one probably 36 hours uh, with 12 boxes. So that explains the difference between them. I just didn't see as much of the conference with this device. Total unique SSIDs was crazy. 309,000 in that short time window. Uh, it's, people are just blowing up SSIDs. Some more about the datas. Black Hat Knox, 65 gigs total there. Black Hat Vendor Area, I caught four gigs when I was standing there just kind of chilling. And that's not a place people are typically using their wireless or their de devices. Some people might have been using their mobiles. The War Walk that went from uh, uh, the Luxor to Black Hat, that was three gigs of data. Uh, you've got the War Walk at DEF CON, so that was about 18 gigs, et cetera. So what about the MAC addresses? Total unique, like just kind of blew me away, 104,084 total unique MAC addresses. So what I'm thinking about doing just for fun is like, hey, was I at X conference? Uh, make a website for that. So you go put in your MAC address or some parts of your MAC address, it's like, oh, hey, you got tracked. It's kind of like, have I been pwned, but for your MAC addresses. <laughs> Another interesting thing is the most noisy access points. At Caesars Villas, they just really, really want you to connect really bad. Same with the Caesars Wi-Fi. You got to connect to that. Uh, yeah, they must have some really high settings on their access points for the, the frequency of beacons because they dominated. And then you can see DEF CON, how much they beaconed in comparison. And like the capture rate, like they didn't change here. This was the static. So I wonder if they've got maybe something misconfigured or, uh, you know, and that's another thing to think about. Maybe you're beaconing too much because you can. It's maybe unnecessary. Some other interesting things, those are the top five SSIDs that I caught on the right, or no, this is continued, this is the top, top 20, excuse me, on the right-hand side. Uh, you know, pretty interesting, pretty interesting list. I ran some regexes and I ran some different things through the data set, uh, but because of the sheer size and, you know, it's DEF CON that, uh, I didn't have any other ones besides the top 20 on here. So what frequencies did I capture? 40 of them. People were broadcasting during the times that I was listening at those two conferences on these 40 channels. I don't think there's a frequency on that, on that list that isn't is like legal to, like that's all the legal ones that you can use, and then some. Some of them are special use, like 5180, 5220, you've gotta have DFS enabled. So I hope they were using them appropriately. We'll see. Alerts kind of small across the bottom. The one on the right, if you can't see it, can you guess what it is? It says broadcast disconnect. Who knows what broadcast dis disconnect is? Dioth. Dioth. <laughs> Those are our really noisy attacks inherently, right? Because you're gonna be sending a packet out, you're acting like the AP. So uh, those, are, those, are, those are pretty crazy. Um, and if, of course, at a place like DEF CON, you would expect people to be de trying to get you to connect their access points. Uh, another interesting fun fact, let's see, I don't think I have a slide about this in the future. Perhaps I do. So uh, one of the things here that we did not see is Broadpone. But you're saying, wait, you could detect Broadpone? Why, yes, we could. Who knows what Broadpone is? A couple of you. Okay, so Broadpone, real quick. I think I actually have a slide on that. That's why, I was, that's why I'm, I'm fast forward in a second here. Broadpone. So what Broadpone is, it's a wireless vulnerability that they found in Broadcom chipsets. This, the affected chips is broad, uh, ACM or BCM43XX. Who knows what the XX means? All the model numbers, the whole range. There's affected devices back to 2005, I think. iOS patched it in March. So if you've got an iPhone, you're safe, you're cool. If you're an Android, they patched it in Android 8 as of July. So if you're running the latest awesome Android phone, you're cool. Otherwise, the rest, you're probably vulnerable. So basically what Broadpone does is it allows the buffer overflow inside of the chip, uh, the Broadcom chip, and it actually allows remote code execution. 
Well, that doesn't sound so bad, right? All you have to do, and what's on this board here, is I was sitting in the talk at Black Hat, because uh, the guy did the public disclosure at Black Hat. I was sitting in there with the Cacti Mini, and this is a PCAP of the attack. This is one of the captures of it. Man, this is really small. I really apologize. Anyway, so the point is, it's super noisy. There's a lot of packets. So it has a SSID. It says Broadpone Test is the name of the SSID. You have to then connect a vulnerable device to that SSID. Once it connects to there, it sends a management frame called a QoS packet, and it's malformed. So again, you can't see it because my pictures are terrible. Uh, basically, there's a bunch of malformed packets there. So if you're looking at a PCAP analysis of it, Malform, 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 all these malform packets. The problem is, who's looking at PCAPs of, of, of their wireless? No one is, so you can't really see this. So with Kismet, I'm sitting in the talk, I'm getting the info about how this attack works. I, inf I message the information to Dragorn, the guy who creates the Kismet platform, and I'm like, here's the detection, here's how you see it, it's a modified QoS. He adds an IDS script into Kismet that night, and we deployed it, and we're looking for Broadpone at, at, uh, um, at DEF CON, and, well, at the end of Black Hat and at DEF CON. Real quick, the damage that can be done by Broadpone is that if it can uh, control your wireless adapter, it's not much of a stretch before it can actually control your device. All you have to do is find a vulnerability in the PCI Express bus that connects your wireless card, like on your phone, to your wireless adapter, which there's already a POC uh, for that that was released in, I think, February by the Google team. So there's a, a public vulnerability. So these two just need to be married up, and somebody can literally have full, all you have to do is connect to this access point, and they can have full access to your phone. So the, I've been doing a ton of research and asking people to send me any sort of POCs. So far, the only one that I've actually seen that's kind of makes me nervous is DDoS. So what you can do is if you connect to that access point on your phone, they can reboot your wireless card, like on your Android device, over and over and over again. And then your phone just doesn't have Wi-Fi. So that's not too bad, and that's a way you can check to see if you've been infected, is your wireless will sit there and just be flipping on and off. But that's also a way that they can start testing for the second part of the vulnerability. So as far as I know, in the wild, it hasn't been executed to the next stage of it yet, but it could happen. And it usually takes you know, a good six months. Like if you look at WannaCry, it took like three to six months for that thing to ramp up. So and it's, you know, we're, it was released in July, and we're in October, so we're getting close, so something might pop up. So patch your Android devices. Um, and uh, yeah, and then if you want to know that this is happening on your network, go get Kismet, the latest one. It'll tell you if this is happening. So we had IDS for Broadpone at DEF CON. And let me back up here. We didn't see it. You're like, what? A brand new vulnerability comes out and you didn't see it? Well, part of it is that you know, I only captured a small window and I was only in a certain location. But I didn't see it at DEF CON. I didn't see Broadpone. Uh, but I bet next year people are going to start messing with it. All right. So some interesting events that happened. Another one that's really interesting uh, that I think is important for everyone to kind of be aware of is uh, when you see an access point, all of a sudden it changes its security type. That's something that can happen. So somebody's basically trying to change uh, the way your device is connecting. So you're like, oh, hey, yeah, my, phone or my home Wi-Fi is there. I want to connect to my home Wi-Fi. But that's weird. It's not WPA anymore. Oh, well, it's still good. But it's not, though, right? Because you've just been downgraded, and now they can man-in-the-middle attack you by connecting to that. So that's another interesting type of attack that I saw at DEF CON this year. We already talked about Broadpone. Uh, how are we on time? Yeah, let's do a quick live demo. See if we can uh, have some fun with the demo gods, shall we? Oh, never. I, <laughs> I give Troy as tribute to the demo gods. Oh, that's weird. Hey, there we go. OK, so um, let me see if I can zoom this. Oh, hey, there's a screen right there. This is awesome. OK, can you guys see that all right in the back? Make it bigger.
just read it to you? Okay, <laughs> we'll start with the Ver Verizon dash LG DLT BRV 842. You didn't think I was going to do it, did you? Okay, so this is the brand new Kismet. Who remembers the old Kismet? What was special about it? It ran in a command line console, right? Not anymore. We got web, because everything needs to be web-based, right? So what's really awesome about this is, oh, just, just side note, this has been running this whole time, and uh, I just plugged into it, and we switched to live demo mode. So, like, freaking, that's awesome. I can't believe this worked. Uh, okay, so down here in the bottom window, what we're looking at is we're seeing um, different types of attacks or just system information, rather. So we can see the IDS stuff happening here, but also we could see, so if somebody wants to launch a DOS right now, that would be totally cool. We could see that going on right here. Um, this is the system information. So on these radios that it has, they're capable of doing 40 megahertz and 80 megahertz wide. So some of the error messages, it has a little bit of trouble switching the first time to the 40 megahertz and 80 megahertz. So that's some of the error messages you're seeing down here. Uh, and then also, uh, occasionally we'll see some of the, the messages. Yesterday when I was war walking around, I actually had my laptop out, and so I'm sitting there watching what's going on in real time around us, and somebody was doing a karma attack right around us. I was like, oh, cool, karma. Basically, a karma attack, for those who don't know, is when you have a single access point that starts broadcasting tons of different SSIDs in excess. That's how it's detected in Kismet. So uh, some of the cool features of Kismet, oh, real quick, because it's like, hey, that thing's got 50 radios, but I don't believe they're really on. So true, it's only like 46 or 48, so pretty close. Anyway, so this is the, this is the list, and I was telling you that each device looks like a physical, lit, uh, physical device like plugged in through USB in there. So yeah, the list scrolls and scrolls, especially at this Zoom, we got some good scroll in there. But um, basically, we can look at each device, see how many packets are coming from each device, uh, and uh, we can also see what the frequency is. You're like, hey, I thought you, because you had so many, you don't have to channel hop. Well, let me give you a, an example of why I do have to channel hop. There's 50 out of 81 total channels, so we want to channel hop to get that rest of that 80, because I want to make sure everything's covered. So what does that look like? Oh, you can't even see it with this zoom. Oh, here, let me unzoom. Boom, boom, boom. Let's see if we can. Oh, it's too late. Can't do it. Anyways, the point is, it's. Uh, I think it was Mav who on Twitter who nicknamed this the Skittle Graph. So it's like just constant red and blue, and it's just slaughtered coverage through all the channels. And the reason why I know it's an effective channel shifting that I've got set up on here. So we've got 50 out of 81. Basically, what's happening is we just have some slight rotation five times a second of the channels. And the majority of the channels aren't even being used here. Like, there's probably coordinated channels, maybe like 20. Oh, hey, that's something we can look at. Let's see how many channels are being used right now. Instead of me just guessing and winging it, let's see how many channels are being used. Bloop. Ah, oh, man, again. Wait. Wait. Web for the win. Can I get a, can I get a web for the win? So here we can see different, all the different channels and what the, what the usage is. So yeah, so that's some good stuff. We can look at what the current usage is. Here we go. So now we can see different frequencies and then who are the big hitters. So uh, yeah, it looks like we've probably got an access point here, access point here, access point here. And Luke, who runs the Wi-Fi, is phenomenal at the Wi-Fi. That's why his Twitter handle has Wi-Fi in it. Um, he's probably doing a fantastic job of coordinating these. So yeah. All right, one other cool thing about this new web interface is the searchability. So right now, I know a few of these are broadcasting as pineapples. Can anyone guess what the Hack5 uh, Pineapple Tetra OUI is, or the MAC address, the starting of the MAC address is? Dude, if you know this, I will give you a coin. Who was that? Come on down, you get yourself a coin. Yeah, that's right, it's zero, zero. So if we go ahead and type it up in here, zero, zero, one, three, three, seven. So by default, these are the MAC address range that they use, right? Because of Leet, right? So uh, uh, we can look and say, hey, there's pineapples here. So I know one of them's mine, and maybe more of them might be mine. For sure, this one's mine. 
But uh, if, uh, if anybody else has Wi-Fi pineapples on right now, you might, have, uh, you might be on my list. So funny story, also at the Black Hat Knock, Pony Express has a tool to detect Wi-Fi pineapples. And you know what they use? MAC address detection. So when you turn on 01, or 001337 as your MAC address, they're going to be like, oh my gosh, pineapples, and throw up a big red flag. They're like, we got you. But what's the thing about MAC addresses? You can change them. They're random, right? You can randomize them. You can do things. They're, they're malleable. So anyways, moral of the story, if you want to troll Pony Express, use that MAC address or change your, Mac, uh, change your MAC address. For demonstration purposes, I have not, but I clearly could. All right, so search feature showed you this. Oh, yeah, there's some other cool client information we can click on, like this packet, and we can understand more information about it. Uh, it's mostly management frames, so it's probably beacons. We can learn about different types. So this is it's super powerful, as you can see. So I would encourage everyone to like go grab Kismet, install it. You can even put it just on your laptop, uh, run in Linux, and just give it a shot. It will probably change your change your uh, view on how Wi-Fi works. It's becoming a more and more mature uh, and flexible product. So again, this is on head. It hasn't been publicly released yet, but it will be soon. All right, let's switch back. Uh, close. Yeah, perfect. Okay. All right, so now I'm going to get into a little bit about what, like, the, the fallout of this project has been. The press. So this is a Medium article. Somebody, uh, um, McGrew Security, I think is his name. I, I believe I have a... No, I didn't, I didn't attribute it on here. I will attribute it, though. Anyways, he, uh, he took this picture of me. I didn't even know he took the picture. And then it ended up on his Medium blog, which was kind of cool. It was very artistic of him. Then I ended up on Wearable Wednesdays. I did an interview with Adafruit. Like, are you kidding me? Like, how does that happen? I love our uh, Adafruit. They're like, hey, do you want to do a, uh, uh, an interview for Wearable Wednesday? I'm like, yes. Arduino then covers the Adafruit article. Arduino has a Facebook post about my cactus. <laughs> Mind blown. Like, it's incredible. CNET has a picture of my freaking cactus in their picture on the article, like, that they're featuring about the Black Hat Knock. And it's not even, like, officially a part of the Black Hat Knock. It's there, but it's not officially part of it. Then this happened. In a CNET article... This guy says, in one corner, is a goofy but terrifying device called a Wi-Fi cactus. What? That is awesome. That is the best description ever. I'll take goofy and terrifying every day of the week. <laughs> oh, like, I, they give me chills to see that. And then, in addition to that, another CNET article, it's got... David Brumley, if you don't know who that is, he's the, uh, the basically going to rule the world as far as like CTF goes. He's the guy that runs uh, everything at Carnegie Mellon for their uh, advanced cyber threat teams and, and plaid uh, CTF, or the, yeah, the plaid parliament of Pony came out of his school. He's just, he did the Cyber Grand Challenge. Dude is, like his team won, like it's just, guy's a genius. And then Gary Kasparov, who knows who Gary Kasparov is? Like chess genius that fought, like won a few games against IBM's uh, Deep Blue before it slaughtered him, but um, it, they're talking to him about an article, and I'm in that freaking article. Like, are you kidding me? It's insane. Then DefCon tweeted me. DefCon's like, oh hey, this guy's got a blog and did a write up, and right at that arrow, <laughs> that's where my website went down. But I got to give some mad props out to Seth from Bluehost because he freaking, he texts me. He's like, dude, your website's down. I'm like, I didn't even know. Uh, my phone's blowing up. I can't even get through the retweets. Uh, and he's like, yeah, we can fix that. Apparently, I don't know how to set up WordPress very good. <laughs> Problem solved. Also, the interest kind of died off, as it usually does. 
then this is like life goals right here. Who knows Swift on security? A couple of you. It's a great Twitter account to follow if you don't know who it is. Basically, it's someone who calls themselves Taylor Swift, who's Twitter handle is at Swift on security. We think it's multiple people. It might even be in uh, artificial intelligence. We're not sure, but it's very witty. And it was at DerbyCon apparently, uh, but she tweeted about my cactus and is like, what kind of demons are you people praying to? <laughs> Again, mind blown. Of course, Hack5 sponsored project, but they also wanted to interview me, and we wanted to talk about it and break it down. And I just love what Darren said here. It just cracked me up. Yo, dog, I heard you like pineapples, so we put pineapple in your pineapples so we can pineapple while you're pineappling. <laughs> then there was another article about me while I was ha uh, hacking or hunting hackers at, Black or at DEF CON and Black Hat. It's crazy. It's freaking crazy. And then the Twitters. Oh, they are the most clever people on Twitter. I love the tweets. Love the tweets. So we had, um, we had like somebody, who, this was interesting. Some guy's like, why though? And my immediate response is, why not? <laughs> Guy with giant wireless router backpack or something. Wow. While I wasn't at DEF CON, I love talking about the Wi-Fi cactus. My non-techie friends get very concerned at first. <laughs> this guy, I love this comment. Looking at this picture is making me tingly, and I'm not sure if it's because of the RF signals or my excitement. <laughs> Wi-Fi cactus out and about in the wild. And then another uh, tweet. I don't know if you guys know who this is, but that's Mike from Hackaday. Like, I literally have a Hackaday sticker on my laptop. Huge fan of Hackaday. I don't know how many of you subscribe to it, but I got to meet him and hang out with him. That was cool. All right, so now I'm going to talk about some of the wins. It actually worked, and I got data, and did multiple live demos, and just did a live demo here. Like, that never happens. I didn't get detained yet. I got tons and tons of data. The response from you guys and from everyone has just been overwhelming and it has been amazing. It's been so exciting and invigorating and it, like made me want to quit my job and I did and now I'm going to try to do this full time and try to make bigger things. And then I got invited to speak at Def Camp, which I already talked about. So it's like, wow, what? And here, obviously. I'm already here speaking, so thanks, Troy. Love you, Troy. All right, you always have fails. There's always fails in projects like this. So one thing that was fun is that uh, once some sort of crash has happened, the Tetris would decide to be like, oh, hey, I'm just open Wi-Fi access points, connect. People are like, is this a challenge? Can we hack it? I'm like, I guess, try. And then I'm like, oh, crap, they're open access points. Lockdown, lockdown, lockdown. <laughs> it's not supposed to be that easy. <laughs> It was pretty heavy to carry around, you know, lead acid batteries. Um, that was definitely a mistake. I'm definitely going to move towards more LiPo situation in the future because power density is higher. I didn't add a car adapter to this thing. Totally should add a car adapter. Makes it way easier for war driving. <laughs> and my biggest fail. It's like Wi-Fi cactus, Wi-Fi cactus. Voting machines. How many of you saw articles about voting machines at DEF CON? I should have put one on the back. Right? And then it would have been like, the Wi-Fi cactus voting machine. Bah! So, yeah, it's all about captivating the social media part of it. So, next year. Next year. All right. So, for next year, what are going to be the keys? More analysis. I just learned about this really cool software called Enzyme. A guy released it at DerbyCon. It's kind of like Logstash or uh, uh, whatever that other tool is. I don't know, I just forgot what it is. Anyways, it's like that, but for uh, wireless. And I just put in a feature request for him to take PCAP files, so it's going to put it into a database so you can do searchability, so you can see if clients are connecting to rogue APs and that type of stuff. The only problem is he wrote it in Java, and I asked him, why Java? And he's like, I, I love Java. 
And so, I don't know, we'll see how it goes. But I'm going to see if I can collaborate with him because it's going to be like Splunk, but for Wi-Fi. So I'm pretty excited about that project. If not, I'll end up building my own. Uh, more radio, right? Like, I started with Bluetooth this year. We're working on getting that working. Kismet actually supports Bluetooth natively. However, I couldn't get it ready for this demo. But uh, for sure, next year we'll have Bluetooth, and maybe we'll have an SDR. Um, Michael Osmond's actually working with Dragorn uh, to get... Um, Hack RFs to be able to work inside of Kismet. Lipos, obviously lots of lipos. This is a this is a pro one, this is a pro tip, probably a segue because I'm not carrying it next where next year. How cool would this be on a segue? <laughs> Real-time data statistics. So I started thinking about it. What if I put a 4G access card in here, push some of the statistics to the cloud, and you guys could pull up and be like, oh hey, what's the cactus up to today? And just start seeing some of the analysis, create kind of like a wall of sheepish. Uh, uh, situation with wireless. And then data visualizations, because you know data visualizations are awesome. It really helps you understand what's going on in the environment. And maybe tactile necks, you know, hopefully we can apply those. Okay, so that's the end. Thank you guys for listening. I appreciate it. <laughs>